on the program today. Uganda foreign direct investment grows by 35% in the last quarter of 2022. And in Tanzania, export of goods and services surged in November last year. And Kenya's maize imports hit a five-year high. Hello and welcome to Business Incorporated. I'm Will Ebong. First things first, as always, let's check in on the market, starting with Africa, where trading was pos mostly positive at intraday. Nigeria's NGX was marginally up 0.03%, while South Africa's GSC was trading flat at intraday 0.00%. Uh, up in still in positive territory, it was, it was negative as well, um, must say. Now, elsewhere, Egypt's EGX 30 was up 0.77%. While Kenya closed Tuesday's trading session in the red, was down 0.10%. Now over to the Middle East, we see trading where was mixed at intraday. Uh, the Abu Dhabi index was up 0.17%, while Dubai's index was also up 0.27%. Still within the region, we see Saudi Arabia's exchange down 0.1%, while Qatari index was also down 0.43%. Now we'll move over to Europe, where Germany has received its first regular shipment of liquefied natural gas from the United States. The fuel arrived at a floating terminal at the North Sea port of Willis Wilhelm Aven, which was inaugurated last month by German Chancellor Olaf Scholz. For more, let's talk to Kate Ferguson from Berlin. Kate, uh, why is Germany investing right now in liqu liquefied natural gas? So the first thing to understand is that while Germany is in the midst of a green energy transition, it still relies heavily on imports of fossil fuels. Now, before the war in Ukraine, it received over half of its gas from Russia, and it wasn't actually too interested in liquefied natural gas or LNG because it was quite a bit more expensive. This has changed dramatically now, though, both because Germany no longer wants to be dependent on Russia, but also because LNG is seen as a bridge fuel in the transition to renewable energy. That's because it's considered cleaner than other fossil fuels. That doesn't mean that environmental campaigners are particularly happy about this, though. They have objected to this shipment of LNG from the United States because it was obtained through fracking. That's a process that is banned in Germany. And now, unlike in previous times when German policymakers were really focusing all their attention on moving away from fossil fuels, the priority this winter has simply been on ensuring the country has enough supplies. And this is reflected in the fact that the government decided to extend the life of both its coal fire and nuclear plants. That was a major reversal of its previous climate policy. Also, how successful, how successful has Germany been with its, plan, its winter plans for energy and securing energy supplies this winter? So on the face of it, the country has done quite well, actually, in maintaining energy security, especially in such turbulent times. German gas reserves are now 90% full, though it's worth pointing out that the country saw some unseasonably warm weather in December, which provided some relief. Um, it's come at an enormous cost, though. The German government has spent almost half a trillion dollars on the energy crisis so far. That is nearly as much as it's spent dealing with the effects of the pandemic. And as I mentioned earlier, when it comes to climate goals, Chancellor Olaf Scholz has stressed that the LNG terminals being built now could be converted to receive hydrogen in the future. LNG could also be used by shipping companies, which are under pressure to find an alternative to the really CO2 intensive fuel they use now. All that said, though, there's still a huge amount of uncertainty about the fate of Germany's energy industry and whether it'll be able to meet its climate goals. And while the country is well on its way towards ending its dependence on Russia, it also runs the risk of of developing reliance on other countries in its place. At present, the main suppliers of LNG are the United States and Qatar. And I think it would be naive to believe that those relationships won't have their ups and downs in the future as well. So what's on the mind of investors today, Kate? 
So German inflation figures for December came out on Tuesday and at 8.6%, they were better than investors had been hoping for. Analysts are putting that down to the government getting a handle on the energy crisis. It's also spurred hopes that inflation in the Eurozone as a whole may be cooling. Investors have also been buoyed by Eurozone manufacturing data, which suggests that supply chains have begun to recover after the disruption caused by the pandemic. Among those posting gains was German chemicals company company Brentag. Its share price rose 5% after the news that it was ending talks about a possible takeover of its smaller US rival uh, Universe Solutions. So a bit of a calmer mood in Europe in contrast to the losses uh, seen on Wall Street. Thanks so much, Kate, for the updates. Always good to talk to you. Now we'll move over to the UK where energy costs is still top on the agenda and governments are making efforts to try and mitigate this cost. We'll be talking directly with Juliana, our Juliana Olainka in London to give us more updates on what's going on. Juliana, good afternoon. Uh, we see that the UK Chancellor is expected to meet with business leaders to discuss energy support. What do you think the outcome of this meeting will be? That's absolutely right. Good afternoon, um, Will. Jeremy Hunt, the UK Chancellor, is right about now is locked into a lunchtime briefing uh, with um, lobby groups and business organisations that represent hundreds of thousands of firms up and down this country who are pretty anxious to know what is going to happen to their energy bills. You'll remember uh, that Liz Trust, during her six-week tenure, put in place some sort of cap on what wholesale market prices would be when it comes down uh, to households, although there wasn't much clarity about businesses. And at the moment, they have a cap which will last until about March 2023. But beyond that, they're just left completely in the dark. And of course, this is of um, increasing concern to them because we have had recent insolvency data saying that businesses are, you know, shutting doors at the fastest time as since they ever have. And this has been exasperated by the current cost of living crisis. Strikes this week is a severe uh, striking week uh, for commuters up and down the country, only about uh, less than half of British uh, uh, railways are working at the moment, which means people are not going into work, people are not going into the shops, and this is having a knock-on effect. So that's why the Chancellor is meeting with businesses today to try and spell out an idea that isn't going to cost the British taxpayer billions of pounds, because at the moment, from a government um, standpoint, uh, the support that they're providing businesses is unsustainable beyond March 2023. We do hope that the outcome is fruitful and benefits uh, UK citizens. So, Juliana, we also see that uh, mortgage approvals have fallen to their lowest uh, since 2020, 2020. And I'm pretty sure this is not the opening or the start the, uh, the UK, the housing market was hoping to see in the first week of 2023. Well, yeah, that's absolutely right. The Bank of England have released a data for mortgage approvals for the month of November. And it's pretty stark, actually, the drop between October and um, November. I believe in October 2022, there were about 57,000 mortgages approved. Uh, four weeks later, that's dropped down to about 47,000. And I think economists are really looking at this in two ways. On the one hand, uh, you know, that mini budget that was announced by Liz Truss's administration in October, you know, completely spooked the market. Um, the, so many mortgage um, applications and loan schemes were pulled um, overnight um, because of the market reaction and the fact that inflation is abating, not abating. Interest rates have risen to their highest at 3%. This is having an effect on um, mortgage repayments. And so it's either the fact that, you know, Liz Trussonomics is still spooking the market and lenders are being more cautious or um, consumers just are putting off uh, buying a first home because they just cannot afford it. And they're seeing uh, all of the news reports saying that mortgage monthly payments are rising incrementally uh, by about three or four hundred pounds a month, which is completely unaffordable at the moment. Mm. No, no uh, uh, housing is supposed to be an asset, not supposed to be a liability. So if I'm going to be paying much more, maybe triple the cost, I probably want to take a step back, Julian, as well. So they, um, how are the markets looking? Are they looking any cheaper? Is there good news in that space? 
Markets are not doing bad, actually, at intraday. Um, it seems that New Year high is still in place. Um, I know there were really massive lows on Wall Street overnight, Apple leading them with a 3% dip, uh, but um, Wall Street's opened pretty well. London is doing good too. January is uh, the time where all investors are looking at what's going to happen with the retail uh, blue chips. Um, Cant have released data. Cant is a kind of retail forensic um, uh, optimism confidence survey. They have revealed that uh, Christmas sales were above 12 billion pounds in the month of um, December. So we'll just have to wait and see what the updates are going to be like later in the week. But at intraday, the FTSE all share is up by 0.40%. The FTSE 100 is up by 0.33%. And the FTSE 250, that's up by 0.86%. The British pound continues its rally against the US dollar. It's up against the US dollar by 0.79%. Uh, one British pound is worth about $1.20 at the moment. The British pound is also uh, riding up against the euro, up 0.17% and up to against the Japanese yen by 0.36%, Will. Thanks so much, Juliana. It's good to have some good news, even though in the market. Thanks so much. It's good to talk to you. Now over to Asia, where Hong Kong's shares led gains in the Asia-Pacific as investors look ahead to the Fed's meeting minutes, watching for signs of more interest rate hikes. Hong Kong's Hang Seng Index rose 3.04% in its final hour of trade, leading gains in the region, while the Hang Seng Tech Index gained more than 3%. Mainland China's Shanghai Composite inched up 0.22% to 3,123 points, while the Shenzhen component fell 0.2%. Australia closed up 1.63%. South Korea's Kospi, however, rose 1.79% to end off at 2,255 points, while the Kosdaq ended 1.29% down. The Nikkei 225 in Japan dropped 1.45%. Now we'll move over to U.S. where stock futures traded higher on Wednesday as Wall Street also tries to recover its footing after a tough first session of the year. Futures tied to the Dow Jones Industrial Average fell 0.03%. S&P 500 and Nasdaq futures climbed 0.4% and 0.7% each. Sentiment was boosted in part by encouraging inflation data from Europe, including a greater than expected decline in the French Consumer Price Index and a drop in German imports prices. Now move over to the oil space where oil prices held their ground uh, on Wednesday after tumbling in the previous session as markets braced for minutes from the U.S. Federal Reserve's December policy meeting. Brent futures for March delivery rose $0.06 cents to $82.16 a barrel, a 0.1% gain, while U.S. crude fell $0.02 cents to $76.91. Cents per barrel. It had dived 4.1% on Tuesday, the largest daily decline in more than three months after the Chinese government raised export quotas for refined oil products in the first batch for 2023, signaling expectations of poor domestic demand. And as the head of the International Monetary Fund warned of weakening economic activity in the United States, Europe, and China. Now over to the gold and metal space where prices for gold edged high on Wednesday, supported by a pullback in the dollar. Although caution prevailed as investors awaited minutes from the Federal Reserve's December policy meeting that could offer hints on the U.S. central bank's tightening path. Spot gold was up 0.3%. U.S. gold futures were up 0.2%. Uh, elsewhere, spot silver rose 0.4% to $24.00. Eight cents. Uh, traders also kept a tab on rising coronavirus infections in top gold consumer China after the country's abrupt COVID policy U-turn in early December. Platinum was flat at $1,084.25 and palladium gained 1.3%. Next, a look at the performance of Africa's stock markets in 2022. How they fared? That conversation next. This is Business Incorporated to stay with us. Welcome back. Now, emerging markets in Africa have had to deal with a huge slump in 2022. And this mad 
in, investments and spoke to investors because there was a slow growth, especially for the exchanges. Uh, we want to talk to our uh, expert, Ruth Orker, team lead, equities, capital market, emerging Africa, who's going to share our insights as to how the economy, I mean, how the um, securities exchanges fared in 2022. Uh, good, after good afternoon, Ruth. It's good to have you on the program. Good afternoon. Thank you for having me. Now, Ruth, most uh, equity markets in Africa experienced capital flight um, in 2022, and that shook the market for a bit. Uh, we later saw a gradual, you know, recovery for most of these uh, rebound in these exchanges. Should we attribute this rebound to increased financial debt in their economies? Okay, um, so some of the markets experienced a rebound while some others didn't, and we believe that this could have been attributed to um, strict foreign capital inflow regulations from some of the stock exchange markets like um, that in Nigeria. We also believe that it can be attributed to the fact that investors also took advantage of stocks trading at a discount on their markets to better reposition themselves for a better gain, and this would have you know, led to the rebound in some of this market. Lastly, uh, strong fundamentals on stock, such as the return on equity, the return on assets and cash flows of some of these organizations that are listed on these exchanges would have contributed to the rebound that was experienced in the African capital market. So which country stock exchanges would you say were the outliers in 2022? We did have some performing poorly and some performing well. What would you, which stock exchanges? Okay, so um, Zimbabwe, for instance, the Zimbabwe um, stock exchange experienced over 80% increase in its performance in 2022. We do believe that after the capital flight, this must have been um, contributed to by the introduction of the dollar-denominated exchange, the Victorian Stock Exchange, which boosted investor confidence as they realized that they, would, they wouldn't have to contend with foreign exchange uncertainties. On the other, on the other hand, um, the Nairobi Stock Exchange of Kenya experienced massive loss of about 24% um, decrease in 2022. This is attributed to the lack of restrictions on capital inflows and outflows, especially by foreign investors on the Nairobi Stock Exchange. And also, um, the Nairobi Stock Exchange has about 55% of foreign investors funding it. So during the capital flights, Nairobi experienced um, a, a decline in its market capitalization. And uh, other um, economists also posed that the general elections in Kenya in August 2022 might have also contributed to um, the decline in investor confidence. So what would you say are the top risk? What would you say are the top risk facing equity markets? You talked about capital flights. In 2023, what do you project are going to be the top risk facing equity markets? Okay, so the major top risk would be the risk of a global recession. According to the IMF, um, about one third of the African economies would experience recession, as well as even other countries in the world. And for African equities market, there is projected rising interest rates, which is coupled with the high inflation that a number of African countries are already experiencing. We believe that this is going to make the debt market, the fixed income market, more attractive to invest investors, which would lead to capital migration from the equities market down to the debt market. Furthermore, the foreign exchange rate uncertainty would pose a major risk to equities markets in Africa. And then um, fiscal instability of nations, especially in Africa, has decreased local and foreign investor confidence. A lot of African countries are on the verge of debt crisis, which would lead to economic and social instability, thereby making the equities market not so attractive to local and foreign investors. Yeah, so we're, we're looking at that and we're looking for ways also to boost the exchanges. I've seen some developments coming up in the space of, you know, African exchanges collaborating. Now, I want to know, it started last year as the African Exchange Linkage Project. I want to know how far, what progress they've made and how has that boosted trade for the connected countries on that platform? 
Okay, so for the African Exchange Green Cake project, the testing commenced in July 2022, whereby stockbrokers and securities dealers were able to successfully perform mock trades then, and then it was officially launched in November 2022. Considering that it's, um, it's a recent development, I uh, would believe that these connected countries would be able to benefit from each other, and this this um, linkage project would create a large market for the equities capital market, whereby organizations are able to raise funding through equity capital raise and through IPOs as well. And we believe that this would also increase capacity between the exchanges, increase their market capitalization, and boost collaborations between capital market players, central banks, and other capital market regulators within Africa. Thanks so much, Ruth Oka, team lead, Equities Capital Market, Emerging Africa, for sharing your perspective and insight into the Africa stock exchange markets. And we look forward to uh, positive uh, uh, performances for the exchanges in Africa. Thank you so much, Ruth. Thank you. Now to other stories, Uganda's foreign direct investment FDI grew to $474.8 million. And that's about $1.76 trillion shillings in the last quarter of 2022. According to the Bank of Uganda, the growth as the FDI rose by 35% compared to the previous quarter ended September, supported by increased activity in the oil sector. The central bank also reported an 18% slowdown in capital outflows to $227.6 million, signaling a return of investor confidence. Now in Tanzania, the exports of goods and services increased to $11.94 million in November last year, from $9.73 million in 2021. And this was driven by non-traditional goods, exports and services. According to the Bank of Tanzania, monthly economic review for December, the exports of uh, goods increased by 7.5% to 7.24 million million, with non-traditional exports rising by 5.7%, emanating from exports of coal, diamonds, iron, and steel, textiles, fish products, and fertilizers. During the period, coal worth 141.6 million US dollars was exported in the period ending November last year, higher than $13.2 million in the corresponding period in 2021, due to largely rising demand for an alternate source of energy following the short supply of crude oil and natural gas amid the war in Ukraine. Now, Kenya's maize imports are more than doubled in the first nine months of 2022 to over 519,000 tons. That's equivalent to 5.7 million 90 kilogram bags following a drop in the production of the cereal due to drought. In a similar period in 2021, the country imported over 214,000 tons of maize. And that's according to figures from the Kenya National Bureau of Statistics. This is the highest maize import since 2017, with the country facing a shortage of the staple, which has led to a spike in retail prices of maize flour, pushing up retail prices of maize flour and 5.1 million people in need of food relief. And that's a wrap on Business Incorporated. Do join us tomorrow for another edition. I'm Will Ivan. Thanks for watching.